Welcome to Uncommon Core, where we explore the big ideas in crypto from first principles. This show is hosted by Su Zhu, the CEO and Chief Investment Officer of Three Arrows Capital, and me, Hasu, a crypto researcher and writer. In this episode, I had the opportunity to sit down with Ellie Ben Sasson of Starkware. If you listened to my last episode with Sue, where we talked about the scaling approaches of different layer one blockchains compared to Ethereum, I argued that layer one blockchains do not scale and that the only way to create true scalability is to perform all of the computation off chain and only post the results of that computation on chain. So Starks are a technology that allows huge amounts of computation to be compressed into very small proofs that anyone can easily verify. What Ali and I have tried to create here is nothing short of the most approachable and comprehensive audio resource on how stocks work and how they will scale blockchains in the future. We start by explaining the inclusive accountability and the true meaning of scalability. Then we dive into stocks, how proof systems work in general, and where these so-called validity proofs fit into the context of unbundling blockchains. Next, we use DYDX as a comprehensive case study to learn about the StarkX system before diving into StarkNet and its trade-offs to StarkX. Finally, we talk about StarkWare's programming language Cairo and how the different costs of proving, verifying and storage are going to scale into the future. If you're a developer, you should also gain a very good idea of the trade-offs and trust assumptions between building on regular layer one blockchain versus the general purpose StarkNet blockchain and an application-specific StarkX blockchain. Enjoy. Hello. Hi. Hi, Hasu. I've been uh, wanting to talk to you for a very long time. I'm a big fan of StarkWare. Um, and full disclosure, an investor, I think you're doing one of the most um, interesting things that happening uh, happen in the block blockchain space today. Can you give us um, a bit of your background, maybe up until the point where you founded Starkware. Yeah, so um, I sort of came to blockchains by chance, meaning um, for a very long time, um, I was a theoretical computer scientist, which means I was uh, studying and proving theorems about computation in a very abstract way, um, with no no you know no applications in in sight. So very fundamental questions about uh, the mathematics of computation. Um, things like, you know, P, NP, co-NP, uh, creatures like that. Um, and one particular question I was interested in starting around 2000, when I was doing my postdoc at the Harvard and MIT, was the question of how to get certain proofs called probabilistically checkable proofs to be uh, shorter and more efficient. And after some work uh, we had uh, a few breakthroughs there uh, with several collaborators, most notably uh, Madhu Sudan, who's now a uh, um, one of the scientific advisors of uh, of Starkware and a professor at Harvard. And um, slowly, um, these uh, breakthroughs started to get implemented first by students, and then I received a grant, and we started uh, implementing them more seriously for general purpose computation. And um, fast forward something like 12 years to 2013, I was um, giving a sequence of lectures at academic institutions about this theory to practice of those proof systems. And um, I was looking for examples, like why would one use them? And uh, at that point, I started to look seriously at Bitcoin for the first time after hearing about it previously. And I incorporated one such example in my talks, and I also asked to present at the Bitcoin San Jose conference in May 2013. And this mm -hmm. was a turning point moment for me uh, because uh, there uh, it was a very electrifying conference. And in hindsight, that was the place where I swallowed the red pill and uh, realized in hindsight that blockchains are a very good fit for proof systems. Um, proof systems are good for privacy and scalability. The first application we did was Zcash, uh, first as academic work and then as a, as a system that's out there. I was one of the founding scientists along mm -hmm. with my collaborators. And I was still interested in like 
better technology that's older but also more complicated to achieve, which we ended up calling Starks. And when that was um, mature enough to commercialize, I uh, basically left uh, my academic position. I was a professor at Technion at the time, and with uh, my three co-founders, uh, Alessandro Chiesa, Michael Reabsev, and uh, Uri Kolodny, we uh, founded Starkware. One uh, concept that always shows up in sort of Starkware's material and that seems to play a larger and larger role in the block sp blockchain space is um, the concept of computational integrity. And as I understand it, this is sort of the main application of Starks. Um, can you explain what computational integrity is and how Starks have to improve it? Yes. So um, integrity was beautifully defined by C.S. Lewis, the author behind you know, Narnia and that whole story. And he defined it thus, integrity means doing the right thing even when no one is watching. So computational integrity by analogy means um, performing the right computation, say with our data, even if we're not watching. And especially when no one is watching, and it's even more so when there are incentives to misreport or sort of change the computation. So let me give an example. Um, you know, most of our finances today are basically just bits sitting on a computer in a bank in financial institutions. Now, we would very much like to know that those bits are handled in the right way, in a reliable way, um, with integrity. So if you formalize computational integrity, it means something like this. Suppose we agreed on what the right computer program should be. Uh, right? We wrote it down. We all looked at it. We agreed this is the program you want. For instance, you know, if it's a blockchain, uh, please do not move my funds unless the signature matches my public signature and then do whatever I instruct, things mm -hmm. like that. So there's a program that checks a signature and then does what it is instructed. Good. So what we would like is to live in a world where when if so someone is in charge of processing transactions and running computation, uh, she is doing so exactly as the program specifies and not deviating from what the program we agreed to specifies. Now, this is sort of a, a, a value or an ideal or a principle we would like uh, to, to have with our funds in the bank, with uh, uh, transactions we do on the blockchain and with any sort of computation. You know, if there is a database containing um, forensic information or health information, Again, we would like the same principle to apply. So we would like to live in a world where we have computational integrity, just like we'd like to live in a society that has integrity. And what Starks do, they are one of several different methods that give you uh, integrity, that assure you that computations that you didn't see were done with integrity. So computational integrity is a value or a principle And uh, Starks are one very good way to enforce that uh, desired principle. For, for me, there are sort of two takeaways almost. First, this computational integrity is actually everywhere, right? Um, yes. I, I think you, you gave a great example in, in one of your first blog posts um, with Starkware, where you gave the example of how do you know that your bank actually performs its own sort of ledger updates with computational integrity And mm -hmm. once you, you know about this problem, you start to realize that they spend immense amounts uh, of resources on sort of signaling that they are a trustworthy institution yes. and um, that sort of they, they employ like external accountants and so on. Just so a lot of resources go into proving this because otherwise society wouldn't work and a lot of things actually depend on computational integrity. Precisely. So, so what you're referring to, I like to call delegated accountability, which means mm -hmm. if you look at the banking world, the state usually will write laws and mm -hmm. appoint uh, all kind of, uh, you know, accountants and regulators and lawyers to uh, enforce and check on behalf of the public the integrity of these very important institutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And the second thing that I thought is blockchains actually sort of almost computation integrity machines. 
right? They are not very fast ledgers or a cheap ledgers. The only thing that they really provide is a ledger where computational integrity is ensured, right? For everyone. Uh, I, I wanted to say that the way they achieve this is by um, uh, numbers, meaning, you know, uh, trust in large numbers, which means, uh, so I like to call this inclusive accountability, which means that anyone is invited to be sort of an accountant and a regulator of the blockchain. And by doing so, that person would take her computer and mm -hmm. now go over all transactions in the blockchain and check each and every one of them. So this is the way computational integrity is achieved today on conventional blockchains. Right. And in a conventional blockchain, this is very hard to scale, right? Um, because it's not, we are not actually bound by the cost of computation or not even the cost of really storing any of the data, but um, by verifying the data, right? So... Yeah, so so there's a very uh, here it goes back to very you know beautiful principles that uh, Satoshi started, but all the decentralized blockchains are following. And the reason the reason uh, we can't uh, sort of 10x the gas limit or the block size of mm -hmm. Bitcoin, and we can't repeat doing this, is not because there do not there aren't large enough computers and bandwidth that can support this. Mm -hmm. That's not the reason. There are computers. Uh, that are that cost more that can process 10x whatever it is that is currently done, but the problem is that you will start having people dropping off. You know the public, the inclusive accountability will will dissipate and disappear because uh, you and I uh, won't go out and buy you know some 64 core machine and some uh, big uh, you know bandwidth connection just in order to verify all transactions in this 10x greater thing. So people will start dropping off yeah. and you will basically fall back to the existing world, uh, conventional world of some big trusted institutions with individuals appointed to check them. And you know that's the conventional world. So we would like to find ways to scale the system while maintaining it inclusively accountable that everyone with their laptops and very minimal work check and verify the integrity of the system. And that's sort of the paradox that various uh, different technologies are trying to solve. Yeah, I think this point can almost not be overstated, um, that it's only scalability if you keep um, the include, if you, if you keep the property of inclusive accountability. Yes. If, if account the cost of accountability goes up, then it stops being inclusive and then it's not you did not actually scale the system, right? You made it accessible yes. to fewer people. I uh, I recently tweeted that um, ever since Ethereum came out, no other blockchain has really made any fundamental advances in scalability, even though they all claim that they do. They only chose different points on, on sort of the accountability uh, spectrum, right? I think you're very right that as as you if you increase the throughput by basically saying everyone is invited to just buy a bigger machine, mm -hmm. then what you're doing is uh, I mean you will get larger scale, but on this curve between you know how inclusive it is and how scalable it is, you're just moving to a different point where the ultimate two points of it are let's say Bitcoin Ethereum style where you with your quad core laptop and whatever, 16 gigabytes of RAM, and uh, you can check everything. And the other extreme is basically banks and Alipay and Visa, where you buy huge data centers and process uh, tens of thousands. And you can pick any point in the spectrum, but the more you go towards the um, scalable by better hardware, um, the more you are excluding the public. Yes, exactly. So. That's why I'm so excited about Starkware and by extension, sort of all forms of sharding, um, mm -hmm. like the other rollups and so on. Mm -hmm. Can you explain how Starks um, specifically scale this property of inclusive accountability? Like what are Starks um, and how does it work? Yeah. So, so Stark is an acronym that I won't go over all of it, but it, it defines a certain class of uh, proof systems. 
And for a proof system to be called a Stark, to satisfy this definition, it has, I'll just focus on the first two letters, it has to be scalable, which, again, not to get too mathematical, means that the time needed to generate the proof scales nearly linearly with the amount of computation or with the number of uh, transactions that you're processing. And simultaneously, the time needed to verify a proof scales exponentially smaller or logarithmically with the amount of computation. So a system that satisfies these two properties is called scalable, that's the S. And the letter T stands for transparent, which means that there's no toxic waste or setup or approving keys. The only thing you need in order to set the system up and use it is basically public random coins, um, which is very important for trusting the outputs, even when when the prover is some you know government or some monopoly, and you don't want to make any assumptions about it. So that's what Starks are, and the way a Stark works is so. We agreed that true scalability for a blockchain means that you don't change anything in the uh, amount of computation and resources that all the nodes need. So what if you could have a way where someone would run a huge computer, but you do not need to make any assumptions about that someone, and you can check with near certainty the correctness and integrity of her computations. So this is exactly what Starks give you. They say someone, anyone can run a prover. This could be Darth Vader or, you know, the worst government uh, that you have <laughs> the least trust in. Uh -huh. As long as you know what program they are using for uh, processing um, and you get a proof, you know that they operated with integrity. And this way you can have all the nodes of the blockchain still verifying the integrity of the whole blockchain using laptops and very standard internet connections and yet scale the number of transactions running on that blockchain exponentially. So what is a proving system? And as a user of Ethereum, how do I know that whoever made the proof used exactly that system and not some other variant of it? Okay, so proof systems started off um, in amazing uh, research breakthroughs in the mid-1980s. Um, uh, there are many variants of proof systems. The most uh, publicly uh, well-known by now are the zero-knowledge proof systems, but there are many classes and they have different properties, uh, interactive proofs, multi-prover interactive proofs, probably checkable proofs, and many others. Um, so there's a wide class of cryptographic proofs, but what they all share in common is the property of basically certifying integrity um, of a computation. Uh, th that's what proof systems give you. They give you the, the uh, you know, the guarantee and assurance that a large computation was done correctly, even if you don't see all steps of it, and even if some of the inputs uh, that went into that computation uh, are shielded from you. That's the property of zero knowledge. So that's what proof systems um, give you. Now, your second question is, how can we trust that, uh, you know, a proof system was used correctly and was designed correctly? So, this is, it's a very good question, and this is, um, you know, a special case of the more general question of how can you trust hardware mm -hmm. and software that is supposed to do something to be doing that thing. So in general, it's a, it's a, it's a tough problem. You know, how do you know that your computer is not uh, logging your keystrokes and reading your keys? It's a tough problem. In the case of proof systems, what, what is really, really nice is that you only have to trust the verifier part. So if you audited, checked, uh, understand, and believe that the verifier is correct and the hardware running it is correct, the math of proof systems tells you that you don't need to make any assumptions about uh, the, the proving side. It can be running on faulty hardware. It can be uh, running any software it wants with bugs or without bugs. The verifier is the only thing you need to check and trust. And the verifier in our systems is run on L1 Ethereum. Its code is uh, open source. Uh, it's audited and being audited. And uh, you know, hopefully there are no bugs. Ah, so I don't need to trust that the uh, solver is running 
so software that is exactly what it says. And I just have to trust the verifier and the verifier runs in, a, in an environment that has very high computational integrity, which is Ethereum, for example, but it could in theory be any other layer mm -hmm. one blockchain. And then I can just like any other smart contract, I can, if I trust Ethereum and then I trust mm -hmm. that um, the smart contract code is correct and does what it, it, I think it does, then I can also trust the entire proof system. Precisely. I see. So how does it work? And maybe not to go too in depth, but just to give sort of myself and our listeners um, a high level idea. How do you generate this property that you have a proof system, you input a huge amount of computational data or data that you want to perform some amount of computation on, and then you generate this very small proof that is very mm -hmm. computationally cheap to verify um, that the computation was done correctly? Mm -hmm. So this is a, it's a terrific question. And uh, indeed, when these uh, results, results of this nature of being able to check the correctness of a computation very cheaply, when such results were first discovered, they were mind blowing. They seemed impossible. How can you know that a very long computation processing hundreds of thousands of transactions, uh, all of them happened with integrity without redoing all of them. And, and you could do this for a generic program. This sounds almost contradictory to all kinds of famous fundamental theorems in math and computer science, right? Like, it is like still mind-blowing to me. <laughs> yes, exactly. Like the, you know, the undecidability of the halting problem basically says that you cannot say anything about, let's say, the running time or the output of a computer program unless you uh, run it from start to end. You can't even save one step on that. That's, you know, those are notions of Kolmogorov complexity and the uh, undecidability. And, and uh, so they're like these very famous theorems from a hundred years ago that say that you can't understand and trust any computation without rerunning it. And here, all of a sudden, starting in the mid eighties, uh, along come these, uh, you know, amazing, brilliant uh, researchers, uh, Lassi, Baba, Leonid Levin, Shafi Goldwasser, Silvio Mikali, a bunch of others, um, and, and come along with these amazing results that say that you can do an exponentially smaller amount of work and still know with near certainty that things are fine. So how can this magic be? Okay, so first of all, the, the, it turns out that there's a huge difference between knowing things with 100% uh, guarantee and knowing it with, uh, you know, 100% minus two to the minus 128, which, you know, minus some negligible error. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that really helps you. The second thing is that these systems are somehow interactive. There's a back and forth going on between prover and verifier. Um, so that's how this magic came about. But with your permission, I'd like to sort of, you know, explain a little bit how, how they might work. So what is our problem here? You want to come to some um, facility, you know, uh, and inspect it. And this is a huge facility. And you want to know that everything there is just perfect. Um, okay. The analog for us is, uh, you know, there's a batch of uh, a million transactions, a million payments. And you need to know that all of these one million transactions were done correctly. So... The first attempt, but you, the, the, uh, okay, what is, you could easily do, but will take you a lot of time is check all of them one by one. Yeah, this we don't works want very that. well, but is not scalable. So the second attempt is to say, well, let me do a random, a random sample. Let me just uh, pick a few and check if they're okay. Now, this will save you a lot of effort. But of course, this by itself doesn't work because maybe there's just one transaction that is faulty and it will be very hard for you to find it or, you know, you won't stumble on it by chance. So here, here's the analogy that explains it. Uh, you're familiar probably with a kaleidoscope or a hall of mirrors where all of these different mirrors are refract, refractoring and amplifying uh, light and vision that comes, you know, so you see uh, one thing uh, repeated many, many times from many different angles. So what if you had some way of viewing these 100,000 transactions through something like a kaleidoscope, something that would refract and amplify any small speck of an error so that e even if there's one bit that wasn't correct, it will sort of be reflected from everywhere. 
Now, if you had such a marvelous uh, and magical contraption, you could use it for coming into this uh, facility, looking at the books with this kaleidoscope, and then immediately seeing if something's wrong. So the mathematics of Stark proofs and other proof systems, what it does is the analog of this kaleidoscope. It applies certain mathematical methods that will refract and amplify any error in the computation. And then you come and just sample it at a small number of locations and check if they're fine. So is this another way of saying sort of the data gets rearranged in a way that makes it easier to audit using a probabilistic method? This is precisely what happens. And the way the data is uh, rearranged is using something called error correcting codes with very special properties that, uh, so basically you ask the prover to rearrange the data and encode it using uh, an error correcting code, and then also to re-encode the computation using these error correcting codes, and then you come and inspect it. So like the way a start proof works in the interactive mode is that the prover, first of all, does the processing, then encodes it, then commits to a Merkle tree of the encoded data. And now we sort of uh, committed to something. So either it's all perfect or there'll be problems everywhere. And then after these commitments are on chain, the verifier comes and samples a very small number of locations and the prover opens them up and shows uh, what's written there. And then the verifier can see if there's a speck of dust or not. Ah, okay. So the second thing you said is, um, there's a big difference between proving something with 100% certainty and 99.99999% certainty. So, and you gain like an irrationally large benefit from that almost. Um, yes. So that in turn, does this mean that um, the stark proving system sometimes produces false positives? So basically saying that a computation was correct, even though it wasn't? Okay, so all proof systems and all cryptography um, has a probability of failing, okay? And um, this is true of Starks, it's true of digital signatures, it's true of encryption. Uh, because Basically, of collisions, right? Hash, hash collisions. Collisions, yes. Uh, yeah, they all have they all have a probability of error. For instance, to give an analogy, in an encryption scheme, let's suppose that uh, the key is 128 bits long, right? So someone can toss uh, you know, coins, 128 of them, and there is a chance that the coins tossed will give you the encryption key. In that case, uh, you know, your, sort of, your system has been broken, your key has been compromised. The same thing, of course, with Bitcoin and so on. So, the reason we say that encryption schemes are probably okay is because we think that it's very, very unlikely for this to occur for someone by chance to get it. And our proof systems are exactly like that. So there is a probability of error. Basically, there is a probability that the verifier will ask to inspect locations that all of them look okay, even though the, the batch is not okay. But the probability of this occurring is again something like two to the minus one twenty eight, and uh, we view that as uh, you know, if you're worried about such errors, that then you don't want to use blockchains at all because they have such error probability. And probably as well. not even use computers. Yeah, you, you don't want to use any encry you can't use any cryptography because all of cryptography has such probabilities of errors. Right, your keys could be compromised with such probabilities, and then you don't want to use cryptography at all. Makes sense. So we just zoomed way in how um, stocks work and proving systems work. So now I would like to zoom out a bit. How would you say that these, so we also call them validity proofs, right? Because we prove the validity of some mm -hmm. computation. Uh, how would you say these validity proofs fit into um, blockchains in general? So because right now we can look at something like Ethereum, and that's how I would most, most people would still look at it, as like actually doing a lot of things that it doesn't necessarily need to do. And lately we are seeing a trend of unbundling these different um, 
jobs almost of a blockchain. So how would you say that validity proofs fit into that? And how does that, how will that sort of make the, the Ethereum unbundle? So if we look at the cost structure of transactions on Ethereum, there are three things you pay for. You pay for uh, long-term storage, you pay for transitional uh, witnesses and uh, call data. So this is something that can be consumed on the fly, but you don't need to keep it. For instance, uh, you know, signatures. Um, and the third thing you pay for is compute. So where uh, validity proofs really help with is in exponentially reducing the cost of compute. Uh, so you can think of uh, them nearly entirely removing compute. Another thing they do away with is the witness data. Most of the witness data is not needed. Um, so for instance, signatures, you don't need them anymore because they are basically just uh, witnesses are used as to support a computation. There's a bunch of choices that need to be made and the witnesses tell you which choices they are. But if you have a proof system, you don't need the witnesses and you don't need the computation. You, what you are left with is the storage. And with respect to storage, you can also uh, save a lot. You sort of, there's a lot that you can do by paying more with computation to save on storage in several different ways. For instance, you can use storage more efficiently by applying compression algorithms. So compression algorithms, lossless ones, will reduce the amount of accesses to storage uh, by doing more computation when you access that storage. So that's another trade-off. So even though validity proofs don't directly reduce storage, they can be used very efficiently to also reduce it in practice. Mm -hmm. Another framing that I have seen is that um, Ethereum has different, or like the, the traditional blockchain consists of different layers, um, the consensus layer, the execution layer, and um, then the data storage layer. And um, we can use validity proofs to unbundle these layers so that, for example, transactions get executed off-chain um, by a proving system or by any party that can then use a proving system to Precisely. prove that the computation was indeed done correctly. And um, so where does, where does sort of the data storage element um, fit into this? Why does the data need to be stored? Okay, the data needs to be stored because um, it's it's basically some variant of the. I mean, it's liveness, or also it also has to do with the um, with the double spend problem, right? With uh, like consensus, because um, suppose there are two different ways for the system to evolve, and both of them are legit legitimate. So Alice can pay Bob, and she can pay Charlie. Each one of them is legitimate. So we need to know uh, what state the system is in. Did she pay Bob, or did she pay Charlie? And for that, you need to you need some storage, right? You need something that reflects the state of the system. Um, users need to know what is the status of their accounts. They need, if they're not tracking the blockchain all the time, they need to someone to hold this data for them. So storage is still needed. Um, as you said, I really like the way you described it. That uh, the execution layer can be very much compressed using uh, validity proofs. Um, and under the execution layer, you can also put the transmission uh, of uh, witness data. That's also part of it and can be removed. Um, and then with respect to storage, there's, there's a little bit that you can improve using execution because, again, uh, up to uh, compression algorithms, what they do is they reduce um, storage up to some you know, absolute value information theoretic one, you know, the amount of entropy in the data. But that's a long way they can reduce things uh, by paying with more computation. So you can even help the storage layer um, using computation or the execution layer. But at the end of the day, you need the state. Uh, I mean, think of a banking system. We need yeah. to know what we have in our accounts. We need someone to know what yeah, the that's the whole is. goal, right? I mean, yes. we are doing this in order to like have a shared state of accounts and update that in a way that is sort mm -hmm. of has computational integrity. Got it? Okay. Mm -hmm. So one, your first product um, as Starkware is called StarkX. Um, and mm -hmm. this is um, effectively an off-chain system where people send their transactions to, and then it gets mm -hmm. executed, and then a proof gets posted to, to the main Ethereum chain. I th so um, StarkX is so fascinating to me um, because I, I use DYDX and it feels just like, so DYDX is one of your four customers. Um, 
uh, in StockX. And um, mm -hmm. so I'm using it and it feels just like using a centralized exchange, but mm -hmm. I know that it's non-custodial. So I can always withdraw my funds and um, it can only sort of change my account balance in, in ways that are sort of valid, right? Um, mm -hmm. That sort of adhere to their, yes, to their smart contract logic. So um, I would like to talk about DYDX as a case study. So one number mm -hmm. that I've, um, I, I have seen is that if you did the same, if you did, if you did a transaction on DYDX, if you, if you did it all on layer one, then it, it would consume in the range of like a couple hundred thousand gas mm -hmm. um, because it's a very complex system. Um, it has a lot of markets. It has um, a, um, cross collateral um, positions, um, which is yes. computationally expensive. However, if you execute it off chain um, via StockX and then post it on chain, and then you look at sort of the amortized cost um, of each of these individual transactions, you end up with something like 300 to 400 gas. Mm -hmm. um, this number is completely mind blowing to me. So please, can you explain <laughs> sort of how do we get from, let's say 300,000 gas to 300 gas? What happens in the meantime? Where do these savings come from? So yeah, yeah, that's a that's a really terrific question, and um, so what is happening? Uh, and it's even more mind-boggling because um, actually DYDX works in roll-up mode, which means that um, all of the changes um, to storage on the L2 system are actually relayed as transmission on L1. So it means that even as you go grow the the, the they're like. I mean, some of our other systems are Validium. We'll touch upon that later, but they have even a, sl a smaller footprint for their storage on chain. So what happens is something like this. If you look, okay, we said that with proofs, the larger they become, sorry, the, the, the a size of a start proof and the time needed to verify it is exponentially smaller than the size of the batch. So it's like, logarithm of that. So just to, you know, without like writing down numbers, let's assume, I mean, logarithm, the logarithm of a number is roughly the number of digits you need to, in order to write that number. So let's work in base 10. So for instance, the logarithm of, of, uh, of a million is six. It's the number of zeros. Ah, uh, there. That's and a the cool logarithm technique. of the logarithm of a billion is, um, is nine, right? Because it has nine zeros and a trillion, right? A thousand billion, the logarithm of that is 12. So let's, let's examine. Now, now we said that the size of the proof scales roughly like, uh, like, um, the number of digits. Okay. I'm simplifying this. So let's suppose that every digit, you know, you count the number of transactions in a batch that you're proving. And let's, for simplicity, assume that the gas cost you're paying is the number of zeros in the in that thing times a million. So for instance, if you took a million transactions, you have six zeros, and it means that your cost is going to be six times a million because we said each zero costs you a million gas. So you have one million transactions and you're paying a cost of six million gas. Mm -hmm. So what you end up is with amortized gas cost of six per transaction, okay? Mm -hmm. Now let's look at a billion. A billion transactions, you're going to pay 9 million gas because we said that's the number of zeros. But now the amortized gas cost has gone down because you take 9 million and divide it by 1 billion. So that's much less than one gas per, uh, per transaction. So we went down from 6 gas per transaction if the batch was 1 million to less than one gas, uh, much less than one gas per transaction as we scale up. So this is this is the way, uh, this is why as you scale up with a system like Stark, the amortized gas cost goes down uh, as the batch size grows. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Now, um, another interesting thing is that, I mean, there's this on-chain data in a roll-up that you need to put. So you would expect each time you touch a certain position, um, you're going to have to write something on L1 that says what happened. But here another effect happens, which is 
Suppose a certain uh, account was involved in many, many trades among those 1 billion trades. So the proof only needs to talk about the diff at the end. So here again, you amortize storage accesses across many transactions. So you're, again, saving on storage uh, data uh, by using more computation, which is this effect that we discussed earlier on. If you have computational integrity, if you can compress the execution layer, you can also save in a very substantial way on the storage layer. I see. So what maybe to illustrate this even further. So I'm a user. I send a transaction to DYDX. What is the entire life cycle of that transaction? Where do I even send it? Do I, still, I don't send it to Ethereum miners, right? So I probably send it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Uh, what happens to that transaction before the the, act, the the eventual state change gets recorded on the layer one? Excellent question. So let's let's go through the workflow. You have a position, and this position is controlled by a private key. Uh, I mean, this position has a public key that everyone can see. Um, it's part of uh, the state of the DYDX system. Only you control the private key. So now you send an order. You want to do something. You want to sell one banana coin and buy one orange coin. Okay, yeah. I'm simplifying it. So you sign this uh, transaction with your private key. And basically, you send it to DYDX, which is an off-chain system. Okay. DYDX uh, will first do some internal checks just to make sure that uh, they're not passing on to the Stark prover something that doesn't, uh, you know, that can't be executed with integrity. So let's suppose this is okay. Um, DYDX will do two things. First of all, they were in their internal system that talks to your front end, to, sorry, to your, let's say, app. They will note that uh, Hasu has now one, uh, is one less banana coin, but one more orange coin. And they will let you trade on, on that information. So you, as the user, get a very immediate finality and, um, and you're, you know, you can continue trading. DYDX know that this is fine because they saw your positions. They know they can do the trade now and they know that, uh, this will also be recorded on L1. Okay. Now this order is, sent to Starkware for it to be part of a Stark batch proof. And there it's sort of accumulated till we reach a number of uh, roughly 10,000 uh, transactions. And all of them, now we want to prove that all of them have been done with integrity. So now we execute them in sequence, see that indeed you can, uh, so, so we sort of check them again. And the reason we check them again is just because we won't be able to generate a proof for something that is invalid. So we need to see that the execution is valid for each one of these things. So we, we check that the signatures, are, I mean, we run the same program that we all know should be the right program, the one that checks signatures and that the uh, trade is valid. And after we saw that all of these things can update the state of the system correctly, we generate a proof for this update to the state of the system. And then this proof is sent on chain with a new Merkle root for the state of accounts. The verifier on chain checks this uh, proof. If it passes, it basically replaces the state of the DYDX system, the Merkle root of it, with uh, the new state. And this is repeated time and again. Fascinating, fascinating. Okay, I think I have a much better um, sense now of how it works. So, um, so I have a few questions about this. So you said um, DYDX, they do their own internal checks. They, they check the transaction. But at this point, the state change is not re yet recorded on layer one. But they already give right. you, they as as a user, they already treat like it's final, treat it like it's final, right? So yes. would you say this is sort of can they never go wrong with this? Like, is this some sort of optimistic finality, or is this is this sort of? I would say that what is happening is that they are assuming risk for a temporary period of time. So, uh, uh, for instance, if they were, let's suppose that you don't have any banana coin to sell, um, but for some reason they said, yeah, this is fine. So, suppose you have zero banana coins in your, uh, in your account, yeah. and you still gave an order, I want to sell one banana coin and buy an orange coin. And they said, for some reason, there was some bug on their side or something, and they said, yeah, sure, let's let that happen. So, let's see what happens in this case. You now, uh, you know, from your side, you think... 
that the trade occurred. I don't know exactly what happens because you supposedly had zero banana coins. Maybe now you have minus one. I don't know. Um, but what's going to happen is that they send this on to, to Starkware. Starkware's prover is going to try and prove this. And there's going to be something that says, no, this can't be done, right? We cannot have a, you know, a negative balance for banana coin. And basically, you know, we cannot prove this thing. So there's going to be some issue now yeah. on, on the DYDX side, right? Even if we wanted Starkware, right, we cannot, you know, a prover cannot prove something that uh, falsifies integrity, that doesn't have integrity. And if the system says that you cannot sell something into negative territory, I don't know, by the way, about the DYDX the system, maybe you can actually be there in, in the red. But, but assuming that this is not allowed by the program, we, even if we wanted, we won't be able to generate a proof. So now there's going to be some process by which, um, you know, uh, in this case, DYDX are going to have to do something about it. Uh, maybe talk to you, maybe cover it from their own banana coin fund or something like that. But at the end, for the proof to reach L1 and be verified, we're going to need to have things that are uh, basically um, uh, legitimate transactions that compute with integrity. So that will have. So that's why I say that DYDX will be assuming the risk. Uh -huh. If anything goes wrong along the process, then be, for the temporary period till it's finalized on L1 and accepted, mm -hmm. that's the risk that DYDX are assuming. That actually ties into my next question. So, how long usually until 10k transactions have been um, collected in a batch and a new uh, update is made on the layer one? So there are two latencies here. One is. How long does it take for 10,000 transactions to accumulate? And then how long once a train has sort of been closed and a batch has been closed, how long does it take for that to, for the proof to be generated and then accepted on L1? So roughly, you know, at current uh, rates, um, it's roughly the order of one hour for a batch to close. Uh, of course, this uh, varies along with time. There oh, are and time by close, you mean for it to accumulate or for it to be proven? Yes, for 10,000 so the current, uh, the average TPS we have right now for DYDX is anywhere between, let's say, three and 10. So let's suppose it's five, okay? So five TPS to reach 10,000, actually in a batch size is 13,000. So 13,000, you know, that's uh, in an hour, there are 3,600 seconds. So 3,600 times um, five is roughly, that's 18,000, right? So yeah. 13,000 takes, let's say, 40 minutes or so. So if it's at 5 TPS, right, every 40 minutes or so, you'll have a batch accumulated that can be sent. And then it takes several hours on our um, provers for such a proof to be generated. So all in all, it takes the order of several hours since the trade was done and until you have finality on L1. Got it. Okay. Um, and then we said you generate the proof. You send it to the chain, it gets mined. And this sort of um, is very interesting to me because in, op in an optimistic roll-up system, you need uh, another third party. Again, basically the delegated um, accountability, right? You have these verifiers that mm -hmm. re-perform all of the computation and, um, and check if there has been any fraud and they are economically incentivized to do so. Do so. But this is not the case in the validity proof, right? It is the Ethereum blockchain itself that checks if the um, if the computation is valid. Yeah, so in, in a fraud proof system, in the optimistic rollups, um, there are two big differences, well, there are several big differences. One is that um, you either, you know, you're a user. So in order to trust the system, you either need to run um, a, f a node of uh, the fraud proof system, which again, if you want to increase the scale, means you need to buy a bigger and bigger computer. In the validity proof world, you don't need to do that because you don't need to trust the party generating the proofs. In the optimistic rollup world, you either need to get yourself such a big computer, or else you will be trusting someone else uh, who will, you know, you're trusting that someone else is watching. Um, the system on your behalf. And indeed, in the optimistic roll-up world, only when there is a suspected fraud does the system start to generate uh, proofs by some binary search mechanism. Um, so they take, as the name suggests, a more optimistic view towards uh, the behavior of uh, actors. 
Uh, with validity proofs, you're taking um, a more stringent uh, view and you're putting higher demands on the party processing the computations and saying, look, we're not going to risk it that maybe the watchtowers are down or colluded with you or anything, and we're not going to be asking users to run these big computers. Every time you touch the system and you say that you updated it with integrity, uh, so please prove it. And uh, you know, on the one hand, this puts more demand on this big computer mm -hmm. uh, that is the prover. On the other hand, everyone can now sleep very peacefully at night because uh, every change comes with a proof. Okay, so um, thank you for the explanation. So are there any um, trade-offs with um, using Stark X compared to layer one Ethereum? Uh, yes, there, there's, uh, there, are, there, are, there, there are several trade-offs. If you let's look at a transaction like uh, you know a payment on layer one Ethereum versus Starkex. So on layer one Ethereum, you have immediate blockchain finality, and you have the security of L1 um, immediately, but you pay higher cost. And frankly, if you took all citizens of the let's say European Union, and each one of them wanted to use uh, do a single transfer once a week. So there's no way that uh, Ethereum could process all of this, period. That, so it, it just doesn't scale. Now, if you do the same payments through StarkX, then first of all, you can easily you know, service all of the uh, citizens of the U uh, European Union doing more than even, you know, doing several transactions a day without changing anything in the um, L1 uh, of Ethereum. So you maintain inclusive accountability. That's the main benefit. Um, what you are sort of losing here is slightly higher uh, time to finality. That's one thing. And the second thing, well, depending on the, uh, depending on the data availability model, you may mm -hmm. be needing to trust um, other parties to keep the data or at least do so temporarily. This depends whether you're doing it in roll-up mode or in uh, validium or volition mode. But that's another potential trade-off. Where is the data maintained? So you have longer time to finality, not instant, but let's say you know minutes to hours. And uh, you have much, much lower cost and much higher scale. That's the trade-off. Got it. Um, what would happen if Starquest stopped processing any proofs for DYDX. So I'm, I'm trying to sort of mm -hmm. explain where does the non-custodial non aspect of it come from. Right, so all of our StarkX systems, these standalone um, layer twos, all of them have built into them um, escape hatch mechanisms. Uh, so we can talk about DYDX. There is a mechanism in which a user can say to L1, Hey, I want to retrieve I, you know, all my funds, please. And uh, in this case, the L1 waits for this to happen um, by the L2. But if it doesn't happen within a certain time frame, basically the system freezes, mm -hmm. in which and in this case, the only thing the system allows is basically everyone to retrieve their funds from L1 by saying, here's, uh, here's a, a path to my uh, vault in a Merkle tree. Mm -hmm. And remember that in DYDX, it's in roll-up mode. So basically, L1 has all the information you need in order to construct what, where your account is and what is the path to the Merkle root. And then you can basically instruct L1 to say, here's an authentication path to my node, please give me all my funds, and the L1 contract will do precisely that. When we say that we um, prove our balance to the uh, layer one smart contract, this only refers to the last recorded layer one state, right? We cannot sort of, anything that happened on DYDX in the meantime, so let's say yes. we made any trades, but they have not yet been proven to the layer one, and this is sort of that the risk that we assume as the user. Yeah, exactly. This was the final. This was the risk that we said that DYDX was assuming. Uh, exactly. Suppose uh, 
It allowed you to do some trade. And yeah. now uh, this proof never arises because, uh, you know, Starkware blew up and DYDX blew up and there is no, this proof, mm -hmm. the proof of this very last batch never appears and now there's an escape hatch. So this very last uh, epoch, this very last batch never, never appears. And then I guess you as a user will have to somehow sort it out with uh, a DYDX or something because you got an assurance on your app or something uh, through yeah. the L2 that this should have been recorded, but it never arrived on L1, and now people yeah. are retrieving their funds. Well, I just, as a user, as I understand it, I just need to um, trust either DYDX or Starkware, right? Because if I, if if um, if Starkware is honest, but DYDX is faulty, then Starkware could still process the final batch. Right to the make the proof and send it to layer one. Well, assuming DYDX sends it over, yes. depending what kind of fault DYDX has. So suppose DYDX just tells you that it's okay, but it doesn't tell Starkware. Right? If we if Starkware got that information, then yes, the, this batch will be on chain, and then your state uh, will be updated. Yeah. Whereas if DYDX is honest and Starkware is faulty and doesn't make another batch, then DYDX can just internalize the risk from their treasury. Right and yes, and find yes. another prover to replace Starkware. Yes. Okay, that makes mm -hmm. sense. Okay, so that's uh, that. To me, I can only say that is an acceptable risk um, for the all of the cost saving that I get. Um, mm -hmm. So we have talked about StarkX. Um, StarkX is basically what, in the context of multi-chain, you know, blockchains and so on, we would call an application specific blockchain, right? It's one, one blockchain, mm -hmm. it's not even really a blockchain, but it's basically one system per application. But now you are launching a second product um, mm -hmm. called StarkNet, right? So the, the known mm -hmm. problem with application chains, there are many advantages, right? but the known problem is sort of lack of composability um, within the same shared state. Uh, so what is the difference um, between StarkNet and StarkX? It's like the difference between a company running a big computer and the cloud. So StarkX is like a big computer that allows uh, specific businesses, ones who have uh, uh, talked to us and asked for this, to benefit from higher scale. So think of that as like the big computer that lets you scale in a non-custodial way. Uh, with computational integrity on the blockchain. So it's like the analog would be, it's as if DYDX went and bought a you know massively big computer that allows it to process things very, uh, very well. But it's it's their computer, right? You can't use it. Um, and same thing with Diversify and Mutable, each one of those has their own like, sort of computer. And then StarkNet is a little bit like the cloud or the internet where or a blockchain. Maybe yeah. that's the best analogy, like yeah. Ethereum. So if you're a developer and you have a brilliant, uh, smart contract that you would like people to use, well, you can just uh, go write it up, uh, deploy it on StarkNet, and um, people can send transactions to it, exactly like Ethereum. So mm -hmm. that's that's the difference between StarkX and StarkNet. Uh -huh. So on StarkX... It's basically a permissioned blockchain in the sense that only one party can deploy their smart contract code. Others can still read it and audit it, that it, it, it does what it says mm -hmm. it does. StarkNet is more like Ethereum itself, where anybody yes. can build their own um, applications. Right. But it has more scale. That's the big difference. It has more scale. Than Ethereum. It, sort of, it, it takes the execution layer and it, it has the ability to compress it from the point of view of uh, layer one Ethereum, so you get much higher scale. Right. So it retains this major benefit of Stark X, but it makes it available on uh, a shared compo composable uh, execution layer, pretty much. Yes. yes. Okay. Will anything change with regards to the provers? So right now in Stark X, um, Stark Stark uh, Starkware operates um, the prover for everyone. Are there any plans of changing that in the future? Definitely a, a very exciting uh, stage of StarkNet and one that is uh, on our plans, you know, the major 
um, next stage. I mean, there'll be a whole bunch of small updates, but the big next change, which we call universe, um, will be uh, decentralizing the sequencer and the prover so that it's not Starkware running those. It's actually, you know, anyone may run them. If I'm, uh, if I'm thinking about launching an application today, um, so I imagine I'm a developer, mm -hmm. is it now strictly better to build on StarkNet? Uh, and does this make sort of StarkX obsolete or what are the trade-offs between the two? That's a really good question. Uh, you know, in the long run, uh, what will the difference be? Um, so definitely if you're uh, um, a developer, okay, StarkX right now is catered towards very, very specific, uh, highly, you know, ubiquitous cases, but still very restrictive. So it is very good for uh, massive payments, massive trading, massive NFT minting and trading. But for instance, if you want to build uh, a gaming application on using Stark technology, StarkX doesn't uh, deliver that. So if you want general pop purpose new applications or you want to have something that is generative art you know something that evolves some some crypto kitty style thing um, then definitely you can't do that on starkx the more interesting question um, in the long run is suppose you want uh, basically the functionality of starkx today uh, you could write it on starknet or you could Uh, you know, talk to Starkware and get a Stark X instance. And the question is, what will be the steady state, let's say, in two years? Uh, we don't quite know. Our thought process on this is constantly evolving. And, and you know, we, we um, actually inside our team, we, we have, you know, some folks have came up with some very interesting, brilliant ideas on how they might live together in the future in ways that both mm. Stark X lives And Starknet lives, and both of them thrive and and uh, benefit from one another. Um, but taking a very high level view, the big benefit of um, Stark X is that because it focuses on very special use cases, yeah, it's very likely that some customers will want that and get get the much higher scale and higher control. For instance, if you're a Visa and you want to use Stark Pay, which is part of StarkX, you want yeah. uh, payment processing, maybe you will want to use a StarkX system and not write it as smart contracts over StarkNet. So we don't know yet what will be the end game with StarkX versus StarkNet. My guess is that they will both have a very long and su successful life, uh, even as StarkNet increases in size. That's my intuition as well. I think you can always do better at making one specific application more efficient than having like a shared system, right? That works for many yeah. applications. Maybe I this agree. is a good uh, time to talk about um, Cairo. So uh, your um, both of your systems require any application to be written in the Cairo um, smart contracting language. So mm -hmm. it's not possible to take an application that runs on Ethereum today and just deploy it either on, on StarkX um, or StarkNet. And I, as, as I understand, sort of your business model for StarkX has been almost software as a service-like. Mm -hmm. So DYDX did not write their own um, application in Cairo, but you did that mm -hmm. for them, uh, mm -hmm. sort of as a, almost as also like doubling as sort of a proof of concept, right? Um, mm -hmm. And um, but this is different for Starknet, right? You don't offer this service anymore um, for anyone who wants to deploy on Starknet. They have to write their own application. Right. So um, what, what happened with uh, uh, Cairo and it, the way it emerged is also a very interesting um, story. So initially, like all um, projects that that work with proof systems, you know, uh, Zcash and. Uh, um, you know, many, many others, um, you start writing by hand um, various circuits, or in our case, they're called AIRs, algebraic intermediate representations. And uh, this is uh, a little bit scary from the point of view of developing code, because it's the analog of uh, putting down a circuit comprised of NAND gates and wires to do some computation. So um, beyond a certain scale, it just gets very uh, hard to do right. Yeah. And then um, 
folks inside our our team um, came up with a much better idea. So, I mean, the Cairo uh, white paper has uh, three co-authors, uh, co- co-creators of Cairo, Leo Goldberg, uh, Shahar Papinian, and Michael Ryabsev, who's also my co-founder. Um, they said that, why don't we write a sort of small circuit that is the analog of CPU? And let's make it very, very simple. And first, this was done for internal, internal reasons, so that we can just write more elaborate code uh, for more elaborate systems. And for instance, DYDX, probably the logic there, which is very complicated, couldn't have been achieved in the sort of ASIC, you know, NAND wires model. Just this would, no one would sign off on it as being secure. It was too complex. But once you have a programming language, you can write code and audit it and inspect it. And that's how Cairo came about. And then we wrote all of our Starkic systems in this way. And then what happened was um, this turned out to be so efficient and usable that we said, wait, why not open this to the whole world to use? And that's how StarkNet came about. So um, today we have uh, StarkNet, whose operating system is also written in Cairo, and people can use Cairo for writing smart contracts that basically came, you know, that are using a programming language, and they're using a programming language that is very battle-tested, you know, with hundreds Mm -hmm. of billions of dollars of trades and several different systems on them. And that's, I think, very comforting to know. This approach is quite different, right, from um, the one that sort of other layer to take. Um, Because if we, for example, look at Optimism, um, they have been struggling to get any traction um, compared to the simple EVM forks, like let's say like Polygon or Binance Smart Chain or other chains that simply fork the EVM and where you have what they call um, EVM equivalent. So you can just take your mm-hmm. your code and just deploy it there. Whereas in the original OVM, you had to make even just minor changes to the code um, in order to get it to work. But that still sort of held them back substantially. So I would, I would be interested in, so why do you have, the confidence that you can uh, require users to rewrite everything from scratch in a completely new programming language um, and still sort of compete um, with those who offer EVM equivalents. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, the bet we, we made with this approach is something like this. When there's huge need and demand for something, I mean, of course, it would be really great if you could just press a button and have your code, uh, which let's say you wrote in Solidity, work on on some layer two. By analogy, it would be really, really great if you could just take your Python code and press a button and have it be a smart contract in in Ethereum, right? Mm -hmm. Or any uh, any other program that you wrote, right? But, you know, multi, multiple, teams of developers have gone through the effort, substantial effort of learning Solidity um, or other languages, Yule and whatnot, in order to program for this environment because they recognize that blockchains are something new. They are a bit different. They have a set of complexity parameters that operate differently. And, you know, we're still too young to uh, ha- believe that this technology can just work out of the box with, you know, everything just perfectly mm-hmm. fine. Uh, you know, on your v- f- favorite uh, earlier code base. Now, we, we believe this is the bet we're taking that with uh, StarkNet, the same thing is going to happen, where people that need the scale and the, you know, compressed execution layer that is offered essentially only by StarkNet, um, if you really think about it, with the security level of L- L1 and without any change to the assumptions there, then we think that they will understand that... Um, it's in their interest to learn this new framework and work in it. And we see some very encouraging steps. Uh, you know, a lot of very good teams are working on it. Now, I just want to say that uh, even, even if we had, and of course, there's a, a, a very important project being uh, executed right now by Nethermind called uh, Warp, that is exactly a transpiler from Solidity to Cairo. So this mm. will exist. Okay. But I just want to say that... Um, 
if you take you you mentioned DYDX earlier, if they just took their previous set of L1 contracts and compiled them, and even if everything would have worked well, they wouldn't have achieved the functionality that they achieve now with our system. And the reason is that most Solidity code has been written to work within the constraints, the execution layer constraints, the limited gas of layer one. Once you move to StarkNet, you have nearly unlimited computation. So even if you continue to work in Solidity, you would significantly rewrite your applications to benefit from that uh, uh, larger compute. So if you're going to rewrite your computation and you want to maximize its utility, we see good indication that uh, developers understand that you're going to want to rewrite it in the native language for that environment. That, yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. So it's not just, it's a different paradigm, but also you may want to change your business logic anyway, right? For example, yes. cross position margin just doesn't work on layer one. It's too expensive yes. to compute. But if you are, if you want to ha have a derivatives exchange uh, that competes with other derivatives exchanges in a computationally cheaper environment, then you have to offer those things, or you will get outcompeted. So it's not just you could not not like you could port it. And the same goes for something like Uniswap. It's not like you can be successful porting Uniswap um, to Starknet, right? Because much better like Uniswap only works because it's sort of the most efficient thing in a very computationally constrained environment. But it doesn't mean that it could compete in a less computationally constrained environment. And that's why you want yes, to Yes, exactly. I don't think you'll see uh, on Wall Street AMMs. And yeah. the reason you don't <laughs> see them, you know, even though trading has been there for hundreds of years, yeah. uh, the reason you don't see them is because they are much less efficient than, you know, standard order books and things like yeah. that and dark pools and whatnot. The only reason they thrive, uh, and, and, and by the way, as a consequence, I think they will thrive only temporarily because what's going to happen mm -hmm. is that StarkNet and maybe other L2s are going to offer um, a non-custodial uh, experience that is much more standard trading and not AMMs. And uh, I think that's where the market will go. Completely agree. So what has the early um, feedback been from developers about Cairo? And if, if I'm a developer, how do I best pick up Cairo today? What are the steps that you recommend here and the resources? So like every uh, new thing, new technology, there's a lot to improve. So definitely we get a lot of tremendously valuable feedback on features that need to be added. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to uh, whitewash it. This is uh, these are the early stages of of the system. So uh, you know you're coming to uh, the new world, and uh, you don't have as much facilities as you had. Um, this was the same for um, you know solidity in the early days. That's perfectly fine. Um, I think we are pleasantly surprised by how uh, positive the reception for Starknet and Cairo is. Uh, so Argent uh, yesterday uh, already published their uh, wallet that uh, will allow you to interact on on uh, StarkNet. Um, it is, of course, uh, major parts of it are written in Cairo. Their experience was a very good one. Um, you know, uh, many exchanges and AMMs are building. I think they are very happy with the level of support that they're seeing. Um, so, so I think overall, we're very pleasantly surprised to see the reception. And um, then to learn it, I will, I will basically send you some links that you can just post. And basically, there, you know, if you go to starknet.io or to chirolang.org, you will basically have all the information and documentation you need to get started. So the last topic of the day that I would like to discuss with you is um, scaling the verifier and the prover, right? So we discussed earlier, it's only true scalability if um, at least the verification cost can stay, um, maybe not constant, but at least like it grows much slower than um, the cost of actually performing the computation. Right. So in, to you know, get a better feeling of this, and also how sort of the um, the stock system is going to evolve in the future, I would like to unpack um, the different costs that go um, 
into it for the end user. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's unpack what happens as you scale up, which in our in our case means that you increase the size of of a batch, right? The size of a batch being proved, let's say from one thousand transactions to uh, ten thousand, then a hundred thousand, and so on. So what what's going to happen to the cost? Um, the amortized proving time, which means the amount of time you're spending proving per transaction, will grow slowly. And it grows like n times logarithm of n. So again, to take the analogy we had earlier on, for a million transactions, taking logarithm to be base 10 as the number of digits, for a million transactions, that means six steps per transaction. Whereas for a billion transactions, it means nine steps per transaction, amortized. So the amortized proving cost per transaction has gone up as the scale increases. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, and this we already discussed, the verification time, the amortized verification time, drops dramatically. So it dropped from six um, per transaction in assuming one million gas for every uh, gas for every digit. So we had like uh, amortized gas in verification of six gas per transaction if it's a batch of size one million. Mm -hmm. And as you go up to one billion, that becomes a negligible fraction of a single gas per transaction because it is nine million divided by um, one billion. So that's roughly like ten million divided by one billion, which is one over a hundred. So you went down from six gas per transaction to one percent of a gas to one over a hundred gas. So a hundred mm -hmm. transactions cost you one gas. So this is very dramatic on the yeah. verification side. And you have a very slow amortized increase in cost on the proving side. Wow. Actually, I thought that um, the verification verification cost um, grows very slowly, but I thought that the proving cost would grow linearly with the number of transactions that you put in. So I was wrong about it that. It grows slightly, slightly worse than linear. It grows, uh, mathematically, we call it quasi-linear, which means as n goes to infinity, your proving time scales like n times a polynomial in the logarithm of n. So n polylog n. So it means uh, if we take uh, you know polylog n to be just the number of digits to represent mm -hmm. n, that's how you mm -hmm. get you know six times n for one million and nine times n for one billion. So let's using uh, for example like n of one hundred transactions. Um, if you scale mm -hmm. that to a thousand, the cost, the, the the proving time, does it increase also by a factor of ten or less or more? Slightly more than ten. Ah, okay. So what can be done? Um, sort of in order to um, to lower the, the cost of that? What, what is possible in the future? Of proving. Yes. Yeah, exactly. there are a number of things that can be done. The, 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 the first thing that is uh, um, most immediate and likely the first thing that, that Starkwell will, will be done and, and work on this already has started is use of recursive proving, which basically allows you to take, uh, let's say, instead of moving from a batch of size 100 to 1,000, mm -hmm. you could move from a batch of size 100 to 10 proofs of size 100, but then prove that you verified all 10 of them. And this can allow you to have now 10 provers running in parallel, each one of them mm -hmm. for 100, and then some additional costs for verifying the 10 proofs. And this will allow you to reduce latency and increase scale. So that's one thing that you can do. Another thing that you can do is start uh, changing some of the uh, elements inside the proof. For instance, right now for security, we're using as our cryptographic primitives, for instance, the hashes that we use to keep our data, save our data and commit to, the, to, to it is a Peterson hash, which is uh, very secure. It's uh, provably secure. Um, you can reduce it to the discrete logarithm problem. But on the other hand, it's not as efficient as some newer constructions, specifically Poseidon and uh, Rescue and GMIMC and things like that. So now all the other validity proof systems are using these newer uh, schemes. 
uh, you know, Aztecs, Zeki Sink, Maiden, Mir, Mina, Zcash, they're all using versions of uh, Mimsy, Poseidon, or uh, Rescue. So, um, and those primitives are roughly 10x more efficient than uh, Peterson. So we could replace that and get like 10x improvement on that part of uh, using these cryptographic primitives. Mm -hmm. We could change things like, uh, you know, there are other parameters of the basic proof systems uh, that we haven't, uh, you know, modified uh, recently, and we can play with those, like decrease the size of the fields to get uh, more efficient proving time. And then, of course, down the line, you have hardware, like dedicated hardware for mm -hmm. generating proofs uh, once there's enough demand for proving machines. Right, so we saw this with regular... ASICs for Bitcoin. First, there were CPUs, um, then GPUs, uh, FPGAs, and then eventually, mm -hmm. or not in that order, <laughs> but uh, then eventually we got ASICs that are highly specialized machines that only do SHA-256 basically and nothing else. And so you expect yes. this to emerge. Um, how, how, how big are the possible savings from something like that? Because it's not, it um, is very complex still, right? It's it's not as simple as just running SHA-256 over and over again. Yeah, so, uh, well, it's it's a bit complicated to estimate, but I think that, um, like, with recursion, there's a, you know, a very high potential for, because you can now parallelize proof generation and then also uh, reduce latency and increase uh, proof batch size. So you could easily get uh, anywhere between a factor 10 to 100 improvement. Sorry, mm -hmm. maybe even a 1,000 down the line, just from that thing alone. Replacing the crypto primitives can give you, on that part, it gives you like a 10x improvement, but that's only part of the uh, proofs being generated, the cryptographic primitives. So let's say, I don't know, you say between, you know, that gives you anywhere between 2 and 5x on top of whatever went into the, uh, um, these are all, you know, accumulative. It's not one and not the other. Then if you change the field size, you probably get another two to four X improvement in many aspects of the system. And again, all of these can multiply and compound one another. And then hardware, it's really, really hard to say because we haven't really started even thinking about that. And the yeah. system, you know, the core system isn't yet stable enough for us to say, this is the way you're going to use hardware. But I would just guess another 10 to 100x just because hardware has that effect. Makes sense. So does this mean you will re you, um, use this recursive proving approach also to uh, create one proof for a bunch of different stock X plus stock net and so on? Yes. Uh, so uh, some version of this already is in production today. So the Sharp uh, service, which means shared prover, what does it do? It takes several different uh, programs, let's say one for Diversify, one for DYDX, one for StarkNet, and it generates one single proof that all of these different systems advance correctly. This is the sharp uh, capability, so it already takes several different things and puts them together. So uh -huh. this is already working. And it's offering great savings to all of the different, uh, you know, um, applications. And it's especially important for small applications. So in StarkNet will be sharp proofed with the other things already uh, from the start. Uh, recursion does goes one step beyond that because now one of those programs being proved as part of the sharp batch is that some proof has been verified. So you can uh, get this exponential saving sort of amplified and uh, multiplied. Okay, so I think that covers the proving cost. Next, we have the verification cost. Um, mm -hmm. And this is basically, it's the cost of basically posting the, the mm -hmm. final proof to the layer one, and then it gets um, verified by, um, so in this case, who verifies it? Is It is the, the DYDX um, smart contract, right, for example? Um, there's a Cairo verifier that verifies the, that basically it gets a, basically a hash of a program, which is the DYDX program and it, and then a proof and a state update. And it basically says, okay, we check this program and this is the new state and everything's fine. And this then goes to the DYDX contract that basically, uh, gets this as input and says, okay, so now we're fine with updating the state of our system. Uh, so there are like two different contracts. 
Um, and in terms of reducing the gas cost for verifying a proof, so one thing that's going to be seems to, that it likely to happen, even if we do nothing, is uh, EIP forty four eighty eight, which will reduce by roughly five x the uh, cost of the gas cost of transmission. And of the several million gas that we're paying per proof, let's say five million nominally, roughly half of that is going. Uh, well, it depends and varies, but let's say half of that or seventy percent of that is transmission, and if that part reduces by a factor of 5x, then you'll see uh, our gas cost uh, going down by that, uh, mm-hmm. you know, by, let's say, you know, factor two to three. So from okay. 5 million, maybe to one or 2 million gas cost after EIP 4488. Oh, that's okay. And then the final cost is um, that of storing the data. Right? In this case, I think we're not talking about the final state update, right, which is not big. We are talking mm-hmm. about the the different balance changes that led to this update, right? So why do we need it? According to my understanding, it is so somebody if if the current sequencer leaves or the current prover, then for, that somebody else can um, take the last state and sort of um, and the the transactions uh, or the the state changes and like co- continue um, the work of the 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 prover, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, like uh, for state updates, um, well, I mean, there are several answers. One is that uh, you save a little bit uh, because you only need to update the, the final state diff, mm-hmm. and you already save there with things like uh, in the DYDX system. Um, in roll-up mode, you can try and do compression, and then the limit to that will be the information theoretic limit to how much entropy does a change have. Mm. And another, you know, the next phase, which will be also on StarkNet, will be to have um, layer two data availability, decentralized and incentivized by various uh, crypto economic mechanisms, mm-hmm. so that uh, users will have the option of trading, you know, security versus cost. The, and this is something we call volition. So either you keep your data on L1 in roll-up mode, and then you pay slightly more, mm-hmm. or you keep it on layer two, and then uh, you pay slightly less, but uh, you take the risk of this uh, security of layer two. Uh-huh. So if you keep it on layer one, then you know it's definitely going to be available unless the layer one breaks. Whereas right. if you decide to, I mean, you could even say, I want Eli to store it on his phone, right? In theory, mm-hmm. you can choose any anyone who would be willing to store your data and sort of make a bet that they will provide it to you when you need mm-hmm. it. And the yes. time, so the time when you need it is only if you want to withdraw from the layer one contract, right? If the if it's sort of in the unhappy case where the sequencer leaves, that's the only yes. time where it really matters, right? Where your data is stored. Well, it also matters like if you picked an untrust, you know, a, 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 a faulty or malicious uh, data availability provider, then the longer you keep your data with him, then the more you are at risk. Is there any risk for me sort of in the happy case? Like, let's say DYDX progresses normally and Starkware is honest as well, but I, I use um, a data availability provider who sort of becomes faulty. Does this have any risk for me without DYDX or Starkware becoming faulty themselves? Well, I think in the DYDX and Starkware system, first of all, it's roll-up mode, but let's say, you know, on the Versifier Immutable X, which is Mm -hmm. um, Validium, they're basically, uh, Starkware and and the Versifier or Immutable are already relying on a data availability committee. So -hmm. as long as we and they are not faulty, you will have your data. But I thought that, like on Starknet, you were envisioning some very interesting system where, like, just like you could decide on which cloud you want to keep your photographs, uh-huh. maybe you the, some contracts will say, "Look, you, you just pick your data availability provider, and when you need it on our layer two, just tell us, you know, what is the path to your state, and uh, we'll take it from there." Um, I could envision, I, I could see such a thing happening in the market for that. And then, uh, if this uh, you know if this Amazon cloud analog is is faulty, then you'll have problems. 
Okay, so it puts me in problems even if I don't want to withdraw from the layer one because yeah. even in yeah, normal you, you need, like you will need you as as the user you will need to provide uh, the some of these smart contracts with information about the location of you know your mm -hmm. your part of the storage. So maybe uh, and maybe those smart uh, contracts don't want to know like you mm -hmm. picked your. You know, you picked your cloud, you decided where to put it. So my smart contract doesn't need to know that each time you interact with it, you uh -huh. go and tell me where, where you know, the, that you have uh, yay many funds here. And yeah. then it will be your problem. So in a volition, if every user, even though they're in the same state, they can choose where they want their data stored. I think that's one of the coolest things that I've heard mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the last year in, in crypto. Um Because yeah. then every user only needs to pay for the security that they they actually need, right? If they want to make a large transaction, for example, they might want to prefer more security. Right. How does it work if um, two users are in the same state and one user has a faulty, let's say, data availability committee? Um, so what hap So the other transactions of the other users who have a good provider, they will continue to get processed, right? What, what happens to those of, um, of a user whose data is no longer available? Well, at the very least, it's that user's data problem. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I just want to stress that, that um, the layer two will likely have its sort of uh, layer two um, validium, which will probably have higher security than the, and maybe cost a little bit more than the various validiums that would be offered by, um, by you know, various entities um, and that's probably going to be safer because we'll crypto incentivize it uh, properly I hope so yeah um, so now like if you have a smart contract that is willing to allow you to work in you know full free-ranging volition which says you say where your data is kept and it's your business to bring the latest state update then I would imagine that the DAP developers for those smart contracts would probably want to have some separation where if your data availability provider did something really bad, then it won't, it will be sort of in your compartment and won't, so maybe you can't trade anymore till you sort it out, but uh -huh. it won't stall the system. That would be a good design. So like maybe yeah. uh, all the other, um, all the other participants who have their data can continue using the system and only those whose data has been compromised by that faulty provider are at risk. Oh, yeah. Okay. That would make sense. Got it. Um, so, yeah. Okay. To summarize, we have basically the, the, the end cost of using the system depends on the proving cost, the verification cost on the layer one, and then the mm -hmm. cost of storing your data. And there you have many different options for what you want to choose. Um, so we earlier talked about sort of the, the cost of using DYDX. We said it would be, let's say, 300,000 gas on layer one per transaction, but using Starkware or StarkX, it's only in the range of 300 to 400 gas. But this did not include um, the proving cost, right? This this only, and, and well, it's in roll-up mode, right? So it did include the, the data storage cost, but not mm -hmm. the, um, the proving cost. So... How big is the proving cost right now? If we were to factor that in, and can you share if sort of after you know the fees generated from DYDX, um, if the system is already profitable uh, to run? Because this it seems kind of relevant. If we were to decentralize this soon, um, yeah. then it must be profitable for um, for the other provers to run it, right? So um, without going too much into you know particular contemporary business details that are very much going to change by the time we decentralize and, and open provers and sequencers for everyone. Um, suffice it to say that the, you know, Amazon or cloud costs that we're paying for running the proving servers are negligible, you know, much less than 5% uh, of the L1 costs that we are paying. Uh, significantly less. So the gas costs that proofs are costing, you know, the, uh -huh. uh, each time you submit a proof, Uh, you pay a certain, let's say, if it's 5 million gas, right? So you pay, uh -huh. I don't know how many thousands of dollars that costs mm -hmm. you. If you look at how much did you pay, uh, you know, to Amazon or Google for the proving that went, in, you know, several hours of proving uh, for generating this, it is negligible compared oh, wow. to those, uh, uh, negligible compared to those uh, thousands of dollars of gas fees. 
Inter- oh, interesting. I, I would have thought that the proving cost is sort of the big one, but it's actually the verification cost today. <laughs> well, gas is a uh, gas. Yes, yes. For very, since the start, <laughs> the price, the cost of, uh, of running the prover machines has always been completely negligible compared uh-huh. to the cost of uh, putting the proofs on layer one, the gas cost. In what way is this, or if at all, is this sort of relayed to users today? Um, does, so well, you, uh, you, are, uh, you said there's two smart contracts involved, right? With eventually like getting the proof on layer yeah. one. So a Starkware smart contract. I, I, so I assume that you are currently subsidizing this. But then for DYDX's part, they are subsidizing it. Right. So our, uh, our customers who are using Starkex systems, they basically pay the gas cost, the L1 gas cost. We incur the, uh, you know, the Amazon and compute costs. Um, and the way I think all of them work is they don't charge their users for gas, but because they have various kinds of fees, you know, uh, transaction fees and whatnot, um, they cover it from there. Um, or they subsidize it in some cases. So I think that, for instance, trading of NFTs on Immutable X currently is mm. uh, is free. So it means that whatever incremental cost uh, for gas you have, and there is some cost, they are subsidizing that part. Right. I think that actually that like intuitively that makes much more sense that it'll eventually on Ethereum layer one, it will only be applications paying to prove sort of their computation and it won't ever be like regular users, right? You will only have mm-hmm. proof, like some, maybe some settlements, but mostly just, you know, verifying uh, different proofs of off-chain computation. That, that's certainly the case on all of our uh, layer two um, systems right now, the StarkX systems. Now in StarkNet, currently there are no fees. Uh, later on, there will be fees, and these fees will be designed to cover the costs of uh, uh, gas on L1. Got it. Thank you. Um, Eli, this has been a fascinating conversation. I learned so much about Starkware and StarkX and StarkNet. And I must say this to me, it's one of the most interesting um, pieces of technology being built right now. And as far as I can see, it's sort of the only, what happens sort of in the roll-up space to me is the only thing that looks like real scalability to me in crypto. Thank you, Hasu, both for having me on this and also for you know carrying out what is probably the deepest, most profound uh, techno- technological uh, podcast on blockchains. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you.